Welcome to the forum, live streamed worldwide from the Leadership Studio at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. I'm Dean Michelle Williams. The forum is a collaboration between the Harvard Chan School and independent news media. Each program features a panel of experts addressing some of today's most pressing public health issues. The forum is one way the school advances the frontiers of public health and makes scientific insights accessible to policymakers and the public. I hope you find this program engaging and informative. Thank you for joining us. Welcome, everyone. My name is Alana Gordon, and I'm a healthcare journalist and producer at PRI's The World. I'm also today's moderator. Our panelists, starting from my immediate right, are Barry Bloom, the Joan L. and Julius H. Jacobson Research Professor of Public Health and the former dean of the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Jess Hackel is a practicing pediatrician and founding member of Pomona Pediatrics, which is a division of Boston Children's Health Physicians. He's also vice president of the New York State American Academy of Pediatrics, Chapter 3. Jillian Steele Fisher is senior research scientist at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and deputy director of the Harvard Opinion Research Program. And we're also joined by Howard Coe, the Harvey V. Feinberg Professor of the Practice of Public Health Leadership at the Chan School and the Harvard Kennedy School, as well as faculty co-chair of the Harvard Advanced Leadership Initiative. This event is being presented jointly with PRI's The World and WGBH, and is part of the Lawrence, Dr. Lawrence H. and Roberta Cohn Forum Series. We're pleased to welcome Mrs. Cohn today in our audience. We are streaming live on the websites of The Forum and The World, and we also are streaming live on Facebook and YouTube. This program will include a brief Q&A, and you can email questions to the forum at hsbh.harvard.edu. You can also participate in a live chat <coughs> that's happening on the forum site right now. So let's start with a little background. Nearly 20 years ago, the US officially eliminated measles. Now the country is facing the possibility of losing that status. It's something that recently happened in the UK, Greece, Albania, and the Czech Republic. Why is that? In the US, more than 1,200 cases have been reported in just this year. The majority are among people who have not been vaccinated. Measles spreads easily, it can be fatal, it mostly targets kids. Though adults can be at risk too, and last month an LL flight attendant died after contracting measles. Policymakers are grappling with what to do. And as one example, California Governor Gavin Newsom signed two bills this week aimed at limiting vaccine medical exemptions for school kids. So today we want to really dig into the forces that are driving the measles outbreak in the US and explore broader questions when it comes to vaccine rates, acceptance, and trust. So let's start by taking a look at this video from Reuters. It was produced in April, so the numbers have increased since then. The measles outbreak is getting worse. The number of new cases in the United States has now reached a 25-year high. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Monday reporting that there are now 704 confirmed measles cases. Health officials are blaming the outbreak on misinformation about vaccines, calling it completely avoidable. They say the vast majority of cases have occurred in children who have not received the vaccine. Reuters health editor, Michelle Gershberg. There are a number of reasons why people may choose not to vaccinate their children. Uh, their children may have you know, a medical condition that prohibits them from getting a vaccine. They may have you know, religious beliefs that run against vaccination. What's particularly concerning to public health officials is a growing skepticism and even fear that the vaccines themselves can cause harm. There's no scientific evidence to show that. There was one paper in the 1990s that suggested vaccines could were linked to autism, uh, and that paper was debunked, uh, and still that concern lingers among certain communities. The current outbreak has been concentrated in New York, where Rockland County declared a state of emergency last month, and officials on Monday called on the public to heed the warnings. Vaccination hesitancy is one of the greatest threats to public health throughout the world. 
So we're here today pushing legislation to remove all non-medical exemptions for children attending school in New York State. The CDC is also recommending people already vaccinated who are living in or traveling to outbreak areas should consider getting a new dose. For those not vaccinated or too young to get a vaccine, the disease is highly contagious and, according to the CDC, can be fatal, killing one or two of nearly a thousand children who contract it. But so far, there have been no fatalities in the recent outbreak. Barry, I wonder if you could help us contextualize this current outbreak, where exactly it fits into the larger history of preventable diseases in the United States. Uh, thanks, Alana. Uh, part of the problem, it seems to me, is actually the success of vaccines. Uh, in the U.S., if you looked at the data before 1963, we had about 4 million people developing measles every year. There were about 48,000 hospitalized at high cost, and about four to 500 children died every year uh, from measles. Uh, the good news is that about 94% of kids are getting their uh, required childhood vaccines. The bad news is there are still pockets and communities where uh, vaccine coverage is uh, very low. Uh, in addition to the human costs of illness uh, and uh, suffering and work losses, uh, there are huge economic costs uh, that could be saved by among the cheapest of all known medical interventions. The problem in the U.S. is bad this year, but that in Europe is far greater. There were 90,000 cases uh, th uh, just this six months of this year, worse than ever before. And that's important because the vast majority of the index cases that started the outbreaks in this country brought the virus back from other countries. Vaccines do two things. They protect children and adults who receive the vaccine, but if enough people in a community are vaccinated, they create community protection, which is very important. It is also important to say that even with highly protected communities, those kids who are not vaccinated remain susceptible. There is no immunity if you're not vaccinated. Um, Vaccines are a unique medical intervention for a couple reasons. Uh, one is it's a rare intervention in people that are healthy, and in this case, particularly uh, children. The consequences of that is the safety requirements have to be enormously uh, strenuous and uh, rigorous if you're putting anything into healthy uh, children. The hardest question for me to answer when I have talked on this subject, when people ask, how can you scientists be so sure that vaccines are safe? Um, it requires some humility and it requires some data to answer that question. There are adverse effects. The targeted for vaccines is about no more than one in a million kids. That's as about as good as you can imagine it. Um, but there are indeed adverse effects. Um, the stringency for testing vaccines, clinical trials, FDA approvals, um, following reporting of any adverse effects is about as good as the system could be made. Um, there is no possibility to be perfect. Um, another key issue is how do people and parents particularly get their health information? We know one thing, that the best and most trusted source is from their physicians. We also know there's a, a lot of misinformation and um, confusion about the information, much of it coming from the internet or spread um, through social media. And in that context, there's a small number of anti-vaccine advocates that provide malicious uh, misinformation and um, that is a real concern to us, uh, trying to help parents uh, make the appropriate decision. The challenge that we have is simply to persuade parents uh, who have concerns to accept vaccines to protect their kids and their communities. Thank you. 
And so, Jess, <coughs> you work as a pediatrician in Rockland County, which has been really in the thick of a lot of the outbreak that we've been experiencing. Tell us about your experience. Well, in Rockland, we've had over 300 cases of measles since last October. And down the road in Brooklyn, there have been almost 600 cases. Most of these cases uh, have occurred in Orthodox Jewish communities. And the two communities in Rockland and Brooklyn are very closely intertwined. There's a lot of interaction, and parents and children travel back and forth frequently, thus facilitating the spread of disease within the communities. Measles is highly, highly contagious as a viral infection. It's spread by the respiratory route. A uh, person who goes in a room and leaves the measles virus there will essentially leave that room contagious to somebody else for as much as two hours, even after normal cleaning. Um, it's it's a, a disease that has a risk of serious complications. Among them, pneumonia. I think of infants on a respirator with measles viral pneumonia, not treatable with antibiotics, requiring intensive care and intensive support. It can cause encephalitis, both acutely during the illness and more troublingly, even several years afterwards, after a recovery apparently has occurred. And it can lead to death with a case fatality ratio somewhere in the rate of one patient, uh, one death per 1,000 measles patients. It's not a benign illness. It's not a rash that gives you an excuse to stay home from school and be real happy. <laughs> and as you've all heard, um, it's been eliminated from the U.S. for almost 20 years, and it's come roaring back over the past year or two. And it's important to emphasize, despite that, it is preventable by vaccination. I can have a couple of different perspectives on the question of why vaccines matter. First of all, as a pediatrician, obviously, my duty is to keep children as healthy as possible. In addition to the 1,200 plus cases in the U.S. this year, there are outbreaks worldwide. Children and adults are dying in Africa. They're dying in the Philippines and even in Europe in an area where we should have first world type of health care services. My friend and the co-author with me of the American Academy of Pediatrics clinical report entitled Countering Vaccine Hesitancy, Kathy Edwards, has recently been in New Zealand where they're having an outbreak. And she told me that they're having 100 new cases of measles per week in New Zealand, a country of population of 4 million. If we translate that to the U.S., that's the equivalent of over 8,000 cases of measles per week. I can't think of a greater public health emergency than to have that occur in the U.S. And again, we've seen an increase in our practice workload because we're catching kids up with vaccines and we're having to have extra time spent to counter the hesitancy that we're seeing with parents. I can also look at these outbreaks as a taxpayer. Uh, between New York and Rockland, they collectively spent over $9 million responding to the current outbreak. Now, this doesn't include the cost of vaccines, which would be given in any case. This includes the extra clinic time, the extra personnel time required to immunize people, to track cases, to track case contacts, and to be involved with the government and develop protocols for isolation and for reducing the spread. In Rockland, we gave 27,000 doses of the MMR vaccine in the previous 11 months. That's about three times the, uh, the normal incidence, the normal uh, administration of vaccines. So the cost to this, for the logistics alone, is significant, and we're all paying for it as taxpayers. Finally, as a scientist, I see opposition to vaccines, and, and in fact, science denial in general is on the rise. It's fueled in part by the availability of, on the internet and social media of large amounts of misinformation. Some of it's there inadvertently, but unfortunately some of it is there intentionally. And it troubles me greatly to see that what we've considered for a long time to be settled science is being so casually discarded and ignored. So vaccines do matter. They matter to individuals. They matter to the nation as a whole, and they matter to the greater society. I'm honored to be able to lend my perspective to this discussion. Thank you. Nice. Thank you. And so, Jillian, mm -hmm. I'm really curious about parental attitudes towards vaccines. You've done a lot of polling on this and vaccine policy in general. What have you learned? 
Well, it's an important question and sort of a lead off because you said, you know, it's thinking about sort of the societal level. And I think that's kind of my role here is to talk about the sort of public views on this. And so it's great to have a chance. And thank you also to the Cohn family for having this forum at such a timely um, moment when it's really a kind of a learning opportunity, I hope, and a, a teaching one as well. Um, and so I think public views are really important and critical to this conversation from two perspectives. Um, one is really related to the, policy, to the public's view in uh, shaping policy. Um, and so I'm going to have a chance to share with you a little bit of results of so a recent poll that we did with our colleagues at SSRS um, and to show a couple of slides. And so I'm going to call to our handy slide team and say, OK, let's look at this first slide here and say, um, uh, I'm going to sort of unwrap here a story that I think gives kind of a good news, a little more worrisome news kind of a tale here. So the first slide really talks about the overall um, uh, support for the kind of policy we've heard on the news clip and we've talked about today, which is the kind of the best policy lever which we have around vaccination, um, support for children getting vaccinated before they can go to school. Um, and what we see is that overwhelmingly, the vast majority of adults actually support a policy like this. So 84% of adults in the US say that children should, or parents should be required to vaccinate their children in order to, to um, have them attend school. Um, and so that's kind of the, the good side of the story, that we have support for this policy um, at the moment. And I think, you know, this policy has a medical exemption, as we also heard in the news story. So children who can't get the vaccine are, are not required to get it. Um, and so where the conversation becomes a little more challenging and where I think there are opportunities where um, anti-vaccine activists and sentiment can kind of play a stronger role is in some of the debates around some of these additional exemptions. Um, and those are usually state level policies, but I think it's important to pay attention to what's happening at the national level because it gives us insights into where there's windows of opportunity where we need to be really cautious. Um, and so um, uh, let me turn to the next slide. Um, and I think what I'm showing here is really that this is happening kind of in a larger context of doubt. Um, and so when we ask people whether or not they believe that childhood vaccines are generally very safe for um, children to get, we see that about of half of adults say very safe. Half's like, okay, half. Feels like when you're talking about vaccines, you want people to be in that very safe bucket. Like we're talking about, as we said, something goes into a healthy child. Turns out that when people don't think it's very safe, they're much less likely to do it, to support it, it matters. You got to get in that in that bucket. The very safe bucket is critical here. Um, it, it, somewhat safe just doesn't cut it when it comes to these things. Um, so um, this is about the vaccine itself. And then my next slide, I think, is going to be perhaps a humbling moment for those of us on the panel um, who would like to think that we are a voice of authority and that if we simply state a fact, it will be believed. And it turns out not true. Um, it turns out that, in fact, we have a really pretty low level of trust. Um, only 37% of adults say that they trust public health agencies to provide accurate information about the safety of vaccines for children. Um, that number could be higher. I would feel better if it were higher. Um, again, you, you need to be sort of in that great deal. The somewhat just doesn't, just doesn't cut it. And I think what's especially worrisome is that um, this is changing over the generations. And so the next slide you can see um, that some of these changes, um, that the youngest generation is less trusting of the old than the oldest generation. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not surprising, but it's important that you see the data and you say like, oh, that's what it really means. So when you talk about believing vaccines are very safe for most children, now we're under a half for those in the 18 to 34 category compared to 61% of those 65 and older. When we talk about trust in public health agencies, we're down at 31% when we talk about 18 to 34, as opposed to 44% of those 65 and older. So um, if we sort of have a crystal ball vision from this polling, it's not a great picture. Picture cloudy. Um, and we kind of, we, we need to think about how we can um, address that and, and also acknowledge it um, humbly as we try to reach out. The other perspective that I think um, polling data really brings to the table is to talk about parent perspectives themselves because this mistrust manifests itself in actually decisions once that person moves from an adult to a parent where they actually have to make that decision about whether or not to vaccinate their child. So we asked parents um, of children under 18 um, whether or not um, they had ever been enough concerned about the safety of vaccine to either um, delay or not have a vaccine. And what you can see as a result on the next slide, we have about 15% who said they have delayed um, or not given a vaccine for safety reasons. Not just about access or structure, or, you know, trouble or payment or any of the other things. This is about safety concerns. So there's a little bit of a, um, 
a sobering start to the conversation, but I think if we lay this out, then we can begin to think about both acknowledging it um, and addressing it in some of the solutions that I hope we'll get to today as well. Well, speaking of public <laughs> agencies, <laughs> Howard, you've worked on both state and federal <coughs> policy, so tell us about your experiences and how it applies to today. Uh, thank you very much. Well, I've had the great privilege of overseeing many vaccination efforts at the state and federal level as Massachusetts Commissioner of Public Health and then as Assistant Secretary for Health, uh, working with the CDC and FDA, the National Vaccine Program Office, and many other offices across the Department of Health and Human Services and across the country. And uh, reflecting on those experiences and hearing from my colleagues uh, makes me think of that wonderful saying, an ounce of prevention is a ton of work. <laughs> When you stop and think about it, this is a miraculous system that has arisen because of the dedication of so many professionals who have come before us so that we could drive these rates down in the United States and around the world. But here we have this resurgence that we're, we're dealing with. And so just to reemphasize the basics, here we have a vaccine, the MMR vaccine, that's effective. 93% effective after one dose, 97% after two doses. It's safe. That safety has been established not only through over a dozen rigor rigorous trials, but also by tracking outcomes for millions of children uh, over many, many years. It's affordable because of some major policy developments that we can talk about later. So every family and every child can get this for free. And then from a health policy point of view, it's cost effective. It saves lives and it saves money. And you can't say that about all prevention interventions. So despite all that good news in the face of it, we have this uh, challenge now. And, and the uh, opportunities that we have to pursue are that we need to keep that community prevention, uh, community protection level over 95%, as Barry has, has stressed. The country has pretty good MMR coverage rates, about 90, 91% over recent years. But there are pockets of these tightly knit, under-vaccinated communities that have uh, closely shared beliefs and the vaccination rates in those communities may be in the 70s or even below. And so it literally takes one person coming back from overseas to, to start uh, some of the outbreaks that we are seeing here in New York and Washington State and elsewhere. So that's the challenge we face not just here in the United States, but in fact, globally. So we'll be talking more about all this. Great. So we want to shift the conversation now to what can be done to combat this outbreak and prevent others. And we want to get everything from the one-on-one -on -one conversations all the way up to the federal level. Um, and so to kick this part of the conversation off, we want to watch, we're going to watch two PSAs from the CDC. Babies require persistence, patience, a sense of humor, and protection. That's why nearly all parents choose immunization. It's safe, proven protection against 14 serious diseases like measles and whooping cough. So give your baby the recommended vaccines before age two and get a little help in the protection department. For more reasons to immunize, talk to your child's doctor or go to cdc.gov slash vaccines. So those are PSAs we just saw as examples of the kind of messaging that goes out to the public about vaccinations and measles. 
Communication, as we've heard, is really critical. Um, and so I'm really curious about these best practices and examples, but just having viewed um, just those messages, how effective have you found that these kinds of messaging is? Well, the vast majority of parents who have questions about vaccines are not refusing vaccines, but they're hesitant and they're confused about them. They're confused about the need for them, about the safety, about the efficacy. Um, and so what we're dealing with generally is not hardcore people who are opposed to vaccines and who won't even listen to an argument that we might make or a PSA or an announcement from the CDC. Um, their concerns can be specific about fear of autism, for example, or fear of uh, reactions or fear of uh, injecting so many different things into their child. Or they can just be kind of general concerns as well as sort of a vague free-floating anxiety. Gee, I'm just not sure. Um, but study after study has shown that parents consider their pediatrician to be the most important source of accurate information about their child's health, the child's growth and development. And they do listen to us as pediatricians. So on the micro level, we provide accurate information about the diseases that we're preventing, about the risks and severity of these illnesses. We provide accurate information about the vaccines, their safety, their efficacy. And most importantly, we provide reassurance to the parents. This is an ongoing process. This is not a one and done kind of uh, thing. We have lots of visits with kids when they're receiving vaccines in their first two years of life. And these conversations happen with every visit. They happen many times a day in our office. And the one thing that we're also faced with more now than we used to be is the internet and social media. Um, if you search for vaccine information on the internet, you are far more likely to come up with negative information about vaccines, about safety and efficacy, than you are to come up with positive information. We're not doing a good enough job in making the positive information front and center. And finally, in terms of social media, what we find is that people tend to search out social media sites which reinforce their pre-existing beliefs. So rather than getting a balanced viewpoint by doing searches and by dealing with social media, we find that people's misinformation and misbeliefs tend to get amplified and reflected back. Uh, and we face this again every day when we talk to parents who have read or heard or seen something. So again, communication is key. We need to do it in our offices. We need to make sure we're doing it widely through social media. We need to be out there and continue to reinforce this message. Hmm. When I think about messaging and what works, I wonder, Howard, if you might be able to talk about your experience of what does work. Sure. So there are many strategies for effective communication and messaging. Let me mention a couple, couple of them. Uh, one message is that if you vaccinate your child, you're not only protecting your child, but you're also protecting your community. That's what community protection is all about. A second strategy is to humanize this whole process and, and make it personal. When doctors and health officials recommend vaccination, you could also add, by the way, I recommend this for my own family, for my own kids, for myself. Uh, I've gotten the flu vaccine on camera several times as part of public service. <laughs> several so times in the same season. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my major uh, memory from serving as assistant secretary starting now 10 years ago was at that time the H1N1 flu pandemic was on the horizon and everybody around the world was terrified about this threat. And as the new presidential administration started addressing this, everyone was clamoring for a new vaccine against the H1N1 flu. So I got to see in the trenches, what it takes to get a new vaccine <coughs> tested and then licensed uh, by the FDA. Uh, lots of safety testing before licensure, of course. And then afterwards, getting millions of doses of new vaccine up and distributed around the country. Uh, during that summer and fall of 2009, we were absolutely concerned about assuring safety of this new vaccine. So we were tracking outcomes. In fact, a new vaccine surveillance system called PRISM was created then just to track outcomes for this new H1N1 vaccine. 
And uh, I personally ran many of the meetings and calls, coordinating the data, looking for signals, uh, making sure this was safe, safe, and then sending the message that your safety is our highest concern. So that fall of 2009, the nation saw two simultaneous influenza vaccination campaigns, seasonal flu and H1N1 flu. 10 years later, people probably don't remember this very much, uh, but it was, I thought, a, a heroic effort and over 80 million doses of a new vaccine was disseminated safely. So those are some efforts that go on every day in public health that people don't remember anymore. But I think the more we talk about these, these systems that protect people and track outcomes to assure safety for everyone, that, uh, hopefully that's uh, an effective uh, communication strategy for all of us. I also think about when you were mentioning misinformation or online and think about tech technology and where we are today, I wonder, Barry, if you could talk about what to do about that or if there are policies or things to address that. Um, thanks. I, I, I've had two thoughts on the subject and having been a dean, number one would be we need more research mm -hmm. um, uh, because we really don't understand where the parents, particularly that are hesitant, are getting their information from. Um, and how to reach them in a way that would uh, uh, develop trust. So that's been, there's much more work going on in laboratories creating vaccines than there is understanding how to get a percentage of parents who are hesitant uh, to use them and, and CDC really needs to get the support it needs to provide us with that information. Um, I think the second thing is very straightforward and has in a way voluntarily begun. There is malicious mi misinformation by anti-vaccine activists on uh, social networks, and at least some of the major social networks have indicated they would either give them lower priority when you search for vaccines or, or none. Um, again, when H1N1 uh, came up, um, uh, I went on the web as dean, because deans are supposed to talk about everything they don't know about, and so I had to give lectures on, on flu. And uh, of the first 200 sites that came up under flu vaccines, there were only two that had credible information, and much of the information were sites that were signed by physicians themselves. So I think getting mischief off uh, the internet is something that really is important to do. Um, when you think about getting that off the internet or having it, um, having more of the focus on the credible sources, right. how do you propose doing that? Or are you seeing things or movements towards ways to combat it? Um, um, uh, Google and um, uh, Facebook and Pinterest have voluntarily indicated that they would screen for it they don't guarantee they will all take it off. They'll put it at a lower priority, and that's not good enough for me. Hmm. And so, um, Jillian, I'm really curious, too, when you think about understanding um, where some of this information is coming from and the messaging, I wonder if you could kind of, what your takeaways are, too, in terms of better messaging. So I think um, I, I want to take it back and say, you know, it, the messaging sounds like, okay, well, we could just give people some information, they would get this message, and then they would be somehow miraculously convinced. And what we see over and over again is that is not how it works. This is really about engagement and about relationships. Um, and I would say that one of the biggest themes from the research that we've done both in the U.S. and globally, um, and I work um, a lot on polio eradication and other va uh, vaccination immunization issues, and it's across the board, is really about the importance of trust in the person who's giving you the vaccine. So we see that this is on the doorstep when you're in Pakistan and Afghanistan, and we see that it's important in the US. Mm -hmm. We see it across the board. This is really kind of a universal human issue, I think, in many ways. And, um, and so trust is so key, and I, I want, then want to put this into the, the context of information and communication in the states and say, you know, the sort of vaccine distrust that we see is not just specific to vaccines at the moment. So if we just think about the context, um, we're at the lowest level of trust in almost every institution you can think of. 
the, the government uh, generally, um, not just public health. We don't have to just blame ourselves for this. There's, there's more to it. Um, it's also distrust in the medical system. Um, and um, as doctors are more part of hospitals, fewer have private practices, there's less of a connection. There's a lot of pieces that I think go to that. And so we can see kind of unraveling of trust in that. And that's worrisome. Um, and I think, you know, we've talked a lot about sort of the information that's <laughs> out there. But I think the key is to try to understand what catalyzes. It's not as though everyone who's walking on the street says, like, oh, rumor's coming by. I think I'll believe it. You know, it's just, no, it's not how it works, right? There's a reason that it makes sense to you. And so if we think about the reasons that it gets catalyzed, that it suddenly makes sense to you, I think it's, that can give us some insights about what we can do. So one thing that we've seen that can happen is that, um, of course, that information comes to you and it's wrapped in a cloth of trust when you get it from social media. Because it doesn't come from an anonymous news organization. It comes from your mom. It comes from your aunt who used to be a nurse. It comes from your brother-in-law. It gets wrapped in this trust because someone who cares about you sent it to you. And that's why they sent it to you. Um, uh, people do have less experience with um, the horror of childhood illnesses because they've lived in the luxury of having the vaccine for such a long time. Um, and so, um, you know, it can sort of, you suddenly say, like, well, well, it opens the door to beginning to question, right? So it's a little bit of a catalyst is how that happens. And then I think when people have negative experiences in the healthcare setting, that adds fuel to the opportunity where the door opens even further and they say, oh, maybe there's something to those rumors. Because you know, when I went, it just didn't seem like anyone really cared about me. I had a really short visit. They didn't really listen to my questions. I got pushed around. I didn't know who was who. We've all been in those settings and we know that that's happening at increasing rate. And so you think about like, well, what we can do then to counter that. I don't have a solution for the full trust in government. I, I don't have a solution for that one. Or trust in all institutions. That's, that's maybe another forum or two, maybe three. Um, but I think what we can do is A, try to support trustworthy interactions in the medical system, supporting more opportunities. These, these conversations are not reimbursed. How we do that, providing more training to physicians, trying to, trying to take advantage of, of that opportunity because physicians are so trusted. Um, we need as public health to be humble about our role in it and to partner with physicians and nurses and pharmacists who are trusted. So it's not just an institutional voice saying you should get vaccinated, but people that do care about you and be connected to them. And so it's not just a message, it's a whole communication and engagement strategy in that way. Um, we do need to call in traditional and social media to be better partners in this. Um, uh, this is a hard thing to do. Turns out building trust is much harder than tearing it down. So um, I think we all know that. And um, so we need to, I think, ask them to do more, I think, as um, Barry's pointed out. Um, and I think also we take advantage of these teachable moments. Um, this has been, you know, this outbreak in the United States is really a tragedy on a lot of different levels, both because of the illness and suffering that it's caused these families and because of the larger issues that it brings up and the worry about where this is going. And so I think. This is an opportunity to start having those conversations and to build on the momentum and to have more support for things like research that can help us understand and to support physicians and others in that process. So I think it's a multi-pronged effort that's beyond messages and more about engagement and respectful listening to the community. So I guess a nice transition to speaking of our trusted doctor and the <laughs> pediatrician on the panel. I wonder if you could kind of take us inside the, that patient room and what are those conversations or turning points? Where, where, where do you get to that? Well, you know, if you've seen one parent who's hesitant about vaccines, you've seen one parent. They're all different. Everybody's concerns are different. They range across the board. And as I said, these are ongoing conversations that we have from the prenatal visits, even before the child is even there. And we talk to parents about how important vaccines are, why we give them, what we're preventing. Those of us who've been practicing for as long as I have, have some experience with vaccine preventable diseases. And that's a really powerful message. Not all, well, today, because some of these diseases have been virtually eliminated, newly trained physicians don't have that experience, but they need to pay attention and learn to those of us who have had it and be willing to transmit the messages. Personally, I've never seen a case of measles. I know about it, I know enough about it, and I've seen enough and heard enough that I can communicate the severity to a parent, and I do that. So there's no one response that's necessary to a parent who's hesitant about vaccines. The most important thing that we can do is listen to their concerns. First and foremost, we listen 
and we address the specific concerns as they come up. You know, in 38 years, medicine's become a whole lot less paternalistic. It used to be you walked in, the doctor told you what you were doing, you did it, and you left. Now it's a much more give and take engagement, both with parents of children, but in general with healthcare, and that's all for the better because it engages the parents, it engages the patients, and has them committed to participating in their own health care. Yeah, it's time consuming. Yeah, we're not compensated for the time that we spend. But having done it both ways, I would never want to go back. So engaging the parents by listening, by finding out their specific concerns. And if they're hesitant to talk about them, you need to be motivational when you talk to a parent. I see you're concerned about something. Is it okay if we address it? So find out their specific concerns and respond to them. And again, you'll find out they're all over the place, from what their aunt told them to what they saw on Facebook to the fact that the pharmaceutical companies have all been charged with all kinds of crimes, so how can we trust them when they produce a vaccine? So they're all over the place. And, and one of our, our challenges as pediatricians dealing on a one-to-one -one basis is to have the answers ready when we're hit with these questions. And usually we're pretty good at it, but occasionally we do get stumped. So there's no one real turning point. Um, it's a process. It's not a single episode by which we can bring hesitant parents around to understand why we need to vaccinate their children. And if you're not willing to invest the time in that process, probably should be doing something else. <laughs> I want to get to some of the regulatory questions too, but just going off of that, do you find when we think about like community partnerships and things that you're, you're stepping outside of the pediatrician's office still as a pediatrician, what, is there a, a connector or is there something else that you found is helpful in building that trust outside? Very much. Um, and, and interestingly, as we saw with the measles outbreak, in, in my practice, the vast majority of our parents were very much in favor of vaccinating their children. And even with the, within the Orthodox community, which is not a monolithic community at all, we had parents, uh, Orthodox parents, in our office telling us they did not understand how somebody could not want to vaccinate their child. So it starts within the office, but it reaches out to the community. What we found in Rockland once this outbreak started was that there was an anonymous pamphlet being circulated with a tremendous amount of misinformation, both scientific misinformation and religious misinformation. And it was being circulated. It was anonymous. You couldn't trace it down where it came from. One of the members of the community who specializes in communication took it upon herself to produce a booklet with scientific information, with religious information, and with civic information. She engaged all the leaders in these various spheres to produce a booklet which was then produced and supported by the medical and religious community and distributed community-wide to get the actual scientific factual information out there. And I think that's one of the factors that helped to bring about the end of the outbreak and convince more and more people uh, to vaccinate. So it started in the office, but it went out further from there and involved all levels mm -hmm. and, and, and all, all stakeholders within the community. And so I want to get to this theme of kind of the legal and the regulatory approaches Howard, I'm wondering if you can talk about how you kind of ensure that accessibility, but also when we're looking at some of the policies now that some of these states are, are wrestling with. Okay, so a lot to say about that. Yeah. Um, first, let me stress that in terms of accessibility and affordability, there's been so much progress. The Affordable Care Act requires insurance plans to cover high value preventive services at no cost to the beneficiary. And so that, that's a major, uh, prevention facet of the ACA, which of course is under a legal review right now. And then there is a program that people don't talk very much about called Vaccines for Children, VFC, that was established in the 1990s, which makes MMR and other childhood vaccines available for free for every family, every child, uh, at any income level uh, without cost. So th those are some great advances that we should all appreciate. Fun funding is always challenging. Uh, there are so-called Section 317 grants that every state commissioner uh, looks forward to uh, learning more about each budget year. And so those grant challenges are one of the issues that every uh, 
public health official has to deal with. Now, Elena, on the, on the regulatory side, it, it's really important to stress that the authority for implementing these programs and then granting or narrowing exemptions uh, rests at the state level. It, it's not a federal function. So we have seen what New York State has done, what Washington State has done, what California did after the Disneyland outbreak in, in 2014. So it's very important that public health officials uh, and leaders in the public sector engage closely with their community uh, in state and local environments so that trust is engendered. So if exemptions are narrowed, those are accepted uh, widely. There's been a lot of discussion about so-called non-medical exemptions, philosophical and religious. But as Jess just mentioned, oftentimes the best community leaders, uh, for example, in Rockland County are religious leaders, like rabbis who, who, who uh, often were very public about vaccination was a way to protect your children and protect your community. So actually in this era of social determinants of health, we're looking for an, non-traditional partners and non-traditional leaders like religious leaders to help uh, promote vaccination and prevention for the future. There's so much more to talk about <laughs> with all of this, but um, we want to move into the question and answer portion. Um, but before we get to that, um, we'd like to invite Dr. Michael Nina is here in the audience, um, recently joined faculty at Harvard. Um, and Dr. Nina has some really interesting research on measles itself when it comes to immunity, something um, called immunity amnesia. And so I'm wondering if you would, before we get to some questions, kick things off. Sure, uh, well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to say this much. Um, so one thing that, uh, besides all of the policy, I think one of the things that's truly lost, in particular with measles, more so than perhaps other infectious diseases that are vaccine preventable, is that uh, the infection was far from a benign infection, and, and there's um, uh, there's sort of a rumor in the in the public sphere that it was a benign infection. But uh, but what I really lost are all the voices of of individuals who didn't necessarily survive measles 90 years ago, 100 years ago, you know, and, and never lived to tell their grandparents and their great grandparents, gra their great uh, grandchildren, you know, about how devastating their infection was, and um, and and those are both due to acute effects, and, and the acute effects of measles can be severe. They put people in the hospital, they lead to encephalitis, um, and they, and they, um, and they, they have uh, devastating consequences. But one of the things that we've been studying um, and that we've really been uh, discovering more and more about is uh, something which we've termed immune amnesia, as you mentioned. And these are actually long-term effects that can happen uh, due to measles, where, where measles can actually eliminate somebody's immunity to all other infectious diseases and can actually cause a child who gets measles to be at increased risk for other infectious diseases uh, for a number of years, potentially, after they actually had the infection. And the problem is these are, these are sort of stealth infections, or this is a stealth uh, problem associated with measles because these children who get measles, they end up going on and getting a bacterial pneumonia or influenza or some other infectious disease that you could chalk up to, to just being a kid and getting an infectious disease and landing in the hospital. But actually, the, the looking at the population data, we see that there's a very strong link between previous uh, measles infections and an increased use of medical health care, uh, antibiotics, and even in, in, a, uh, in a lot of under-resourced countries, um, very high death for two to three years. And so um, I think that these are, this is a new line of research. Um, I think the evidence is very strong and, um, and I think it's something that I, I hope that you know, the, can maybe get out there. It's it, that measles is truly not benign and there's even these very long, uh, long term effects that could really um, have large, large ramifications at a public health and at a clinical um, level. And so, yeah. It's very powerful to think about. Thank you. Um, we're going to move now to some questions that we've been getting from online. Um, and so I want to start with a question from Joyce Frieden, Washington editor for MedPage Today. And it has to do with Jillian's uh, polling data showing that only 31% of those ages 18 to 34 trust 
public health agencies to provide accurate information about vaccines. And so the question is, why do you think public confidence in these agencies is so low? I wonder, you know, what can be done to improve that number? So, um, so uh, I'm glad someone, you know, this is such a critical issue for me. Um, and I think it's one I think about a lot. Um, and the answers aren't simple. So it may be disappointing to say, oh, I, I wish I just had a solution. We just crank that number right up. Um, I think um, <coughs> the reason that it's low, right, has to do with this broader societal distrust of institutions and government and what's happening more broadly. Um, uh, and then I think there are some incidents around um, you know, that people feel individually that they weren't connected and they, they don't, may not see the total distinction between the medical system and public health. People don't understand. It, it gets kind of muddled in their mind. But they just say, like, you know, they're not, they're not giving me the real story. They believe there's collusion. There's all sorts of things they begin to connect. Um, and I think that we need more examples of how much it works and to connect people to public health and for public health to say, okay, well, we actually need to partner with these other trusted institutions and, and building trust by example. You know, I think the success of actually containing the measles outbreak, um, that is an example where we say, actually, this is something public health did really well. And showcasing that and partnering and getting the people out who were involved in the front lines and saying, hey, look, this is what it looks like. It's not just like some, you know, monolith in a gray building, right? There's actually a person and there was a child who was saved. Um, and that's what it looks like. And that can build it. And we do see that under certain circumstances, we do see that trust go up. Um, and so we want to take advantage of those opportunities where public health does such a great job and to showcase that and to also partner with other institutions or other um, people who do make that case and can show the compassion at a personal level. Yeah. So I hope she'll put that in her stories. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a question I wanted to ask um, from somebody who emailed in. We have a nine month old and are traveling outside the country, which gets me thinking a lot about the kind of global aspects right now of measles. Are additional recommendations being issued around measles vaccinations in cases like this, given that the first vaccination is generally given at 12 months? And I'm also curious how that connects to some of, when we talk about these global themes. Well, the, as, as, as you said, the measles vaccine is, has an indication for 12 months and up. And two doses after 12 months of age, separated by at least 28 days, is required to complete immunization. Having said that, in children as young as six months of age, the measles vaccine may have some effectiveness <coughs> in producing an immunity. Under six months, not at all because of transferred maternal antibody from prior to delivery. So the recommendation has been in Rockland County with the outbreak, all children six months and of, of age and over were given a dose. Given that the outbreak has decreased then, if parents are planning on traveling with a child between six and 12 months to an area where measles is endemic, and that unfortunately includes a whole lot of the world right now, we do recommend that the child receive a dose of the MMR vaccine at least two weeks prior to travel. That will not count as one of the two doses required for immunization for school entry, for example. So two more doses after a year will still be necessary, but you can give the child some protection during that vulnerable period during the time of travel with that earlier dose. Another question that we've received has to do with supporting immunization requirement laws um, at the state level. Um, and so California, as we referenced recently, tightened its physician oversight, um, but lawmakers have also received threats while passing legislation. And so what sorts of paths forward do you see in states when lawmakers are facing these sorts of tensions when they sponsor legislation, as well as what sort of support of requirements are, th are there for immunizations? I wonder, um, Howard, if you might be able to take this one. Well, in California, where they narrowed exemptions after the Disneyland outbreak in 2014, there's been an evaluation of uh, what happened afterwards, and the rates of unimmunized kids entering school uh, went down uh, significantly. And so the, the coverage was in increased, and, and that's been well documented. So I think because this is a state-by-state -state 
issue. There has to be, first of all, good communication, uh, as, as I mentioned before. And then when these policies are changed, we need very, very good evaluation, uh, as high level science as possible, and sharing that with others so that when their time comes, they have some experience to, to build on. Uh, I'm not sure I can say much more than that because uh, this is such a dynamic area. And I know that when we have outbreaks like this, every state looks and says, OK, what, what are we going to learn from this? And how can we protect our public uh, e even more strongly? So I, I think these discussions are healthy because we, can't not, we cannot take our public health systems for granted. They're always very fragile. They're always underfunded. Uh, the, the staff and the, and the frontline physicians are very overworked. And uh, these, these can be opportunities to educate people what public health is all about and uh, change the um, re regulations and laws accordingly. May I make a comment? Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, there are only two states that have not had exemptions for non-medical reasons, uh, Mississippi and West Virginia. And they did not have any major outbreaks for a very long time. Um, but the serious point I wanted to make is when you raise the legal issue, um, the courts decided in a case called Kaufman uh, versus the United States in uh, 19, uh, 18, uh, 1905 um, that um, all freedoms have some constraints or restrictions. And um, the court decided that it was the state's obligation, and I quote, to protect the public health and the public safety uh, confessedly endangered by the presence of a dangerous disease. And that decision has been legally binding and confirmed through the Supreme Court ever since. So there is a legal basis for imposing to protect the public good uh, uh, constraints on individual freedoms. Hmm. Uh, we'll do one more question, which is um, comes from someone who has been working in polio and other immunization for many years in India, Kenya, Somalia, um, and has been thinking a lot about and looking into the confidence that people have in public health programs. And the question is about how much use of social media platforms is done for health education about vaccines and what's the outcome of that? Um, Jillian or? Sure. I mean, I can talk about it certainly in the polio context because yeah. um, I do a lot of work um, with UNICEF around um, polio vaccine. Um, and I think, uh, I think that we're trying to figure out how to use social media effectively. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, people may be aware that this spring, um, in Pakistan, there was a very negative social media that went out that was untrue about the effect of the virus on children. And it had really um, terrible effects, not only in terms of reduced vaccination, but in terms of um, actually assaults on vaccinators. Um, and so um, unrest, burning of buildings, like it was, it was really quite devastating. Um, and so people, I think, are a little bit wary about social media because they can see that it goes hot fast. Um, and yet we need to engage people where they are. And so trying to figure out both calling on um, social media to be responsible around trying to reduce and hopefully eliminate um, the source of information, um, uh, uh, but also thinking about how you partner effectively in that, where you can actually sort of leverage the networks that exist. I mean, this, I think, goes to Barry's earlier point, which is that we don't totally understand what it's like out there. Um, and we need to engage that in a respectful way and learn from people and figure out how we can have a social media-based conversation um, that um, you know, doesn't suddenly run hot and yet engages people in a way that where they really are. Um, and so I think we're kind of at the front of that. We're trying different things. I'm also trying to engage not only people, but also vaccinator, you know, parents, but also vaccinators, um, and trying to create a more shared community where people can um, share a lot of their positive experiences as well. Yeah. Um, well, we're going to wrap up now because yeah. I feel like we're just getting started. So many <laughs> questions. Um, but I want to give all the panelists a chance for some closing remarks. Barry, we can start with you. Um, uh, my closing remarks would be very simple, and that is there is no place in the world from which, from the point of view of infectious diseases, we are remote, and no one from whom we may 
not be connected. So it's one world from the point of view of infectious diseases. I also have a simple statement, and that's basically that no child should suffer from a vaccine-preventable illness. We need to continue to counter, uh, to be aware of the science denial, the vaccine hesitancy, and the misinformation, and we need to remind parents consistently and continuously of the necessity, the safety, and the efficacy of the vaccines. And we need to respond to parental confusion and fear with support and trust and it's an ongoing process, and we just need to continue that. Um, I want to echo and build off of what you just said in terms of um, where, where this goes in terms of understanding and connecting with parents. Um, parents come and have concerns about vaccines because they love their children, and that is a universal. And so if we take that as the premise, as we understand that, as that they are concerned, they are genuinely concerned, and they love their kids, and they want to do the best for them, that is a respectful place to start, and that's where we have the conversation, and we understand their perspective. We don't demonize it from public health, and we engage with them respectfully, um, both at a macro level and an individual level. I think um, we have a chance. Uh, well, one of my favorite sayings about prevention is, when prevention works, absolutely nothing happens, and things are very boring, dot, dot, dot. Let us all pray for a little boredom. <laughs> And that's what public health is all about, because when public health and prevention work, you get to enjoy the miracle of an absolutely normal, healthy day. And that's what vaccines have done for millions of kids. And so our job is to keep that message of prevention alive and going forward. Thank you, everybody, for this really powerful conversation. Um, that basically wraps things up for now but um, at the forum, but please be sure to tune into the next one on mental health and wellness for students of color and transitioning to college. So that is on September 18th at noon at forumhsph.org. <laughs>